All right, so welcome. Uh, we have an awesome guest today, Ryan Smith from Elevation Capital, a great friend, just an awesome guy. Uh, he's going to talk to us about mobile home parks and self-storage, and they do some really unique things with their investment fund uh, as far as projecting or not offering projections. I think it's really interesting. Great interview. I think you're really going to enjoy it. So uh, here's Ryan. All right, so welcome to Mailbox Money. I'm here with the Ryan Smith. Really excited to have him with us. And uh, he has a lot of experience, about 15 years of experience uh, doing mobile home parks as well as self-storage. And so right now they have over 20,000 uh, mobile home uh, units, uh, all, mobile home lots all around different parts of the country. So really excited to talk with him and unpack this. How are you doing today, Ryan? Doing great. Good to be with you. Yeah, it's great to have you. I know you're out in Florida. We were just talking about uh, being in LA versus Florida and some of the changes over the last couple of years that's happened due to COVID, but uh, we've got to be grateful for everything we have. So, uh, but Amen. awesome. I'm, uh, I'm excited to talk with you. Why don't you give uh, our listeners just a little bit of idea of who you are and some of your background and kind of what you're doing now? You know, um, I guess real short story, highly curious person, like trying to make things better, uh, you know, across everything we touch hence the name Elevation, um, you know, started a tech company, software company when I was a teenager, ended up building it into a, a user base of about 100,000 um, users of my software globally. It was a real estate application um, that I built, um, parlayed that into single family residential. We ended up building, Jamie and I, my wife and I, a portfolio of about 25 single family houses, then parlayed that into mobile home parks and um, added storage along the way. Um, kind of proved out a model, had friends and family saying, hey, how can we hitch our wagon to your horse? You know, how do we participate in what you're building? And um, we had to think hard about that because um, there's a whole discussion on that. Um, uh, starting a fund is not the cure to everything. Um, and I, we don't certainly view it as such. So started our first fund in 2010. Now we're on fund date because we have no marketing department uh, in terms of naming schemes. Um, <laughs> Fire to one day have a fun nine and 10. So yeah, absolutely. Well, it's funny, you know, sometimes the more flash you put in it, the more people kind of like, this feels a little salesy, but if you're just like, <laughs> yeah. what you see is what you get, you know, it's just fun number eight, you know, it's not as if you that creative, but you guys obviously have good substance because you've been able to grow to yeah. just a huge, uh, you know, huge operation now. So uh, you mentioned, it's interesting. A lot of our investors are passive or they do some active things such as single family. And a lot of people start with single family and like myself think, oh, I'm going to get to be financially free through single family. And then they realize, becoming more passive is actually a better way to go because it's really scalable. And so talk to us a little bit about, uh, you know, mobile home parks. Maybe we start with that. What is it you sure. like about mobile home parks? What do you like about, uh, I know you have a fund that does both of these, but just breaking down mobile home, mobile home parks, what, what, tell us a little bit about that uh, asset and kind of what's happening right now in the U.S. in that area. Yeah, so I, I mean, I guess it may be even helpful to compare it to storage because there are similarities and differences. So they're similar in ways that are additive, but they're also different in ways uh, that are additive. So, you know, in short, um, it all it's all based around the value of a dollar, right? So, you know, net operating income is, you know, instrumental part, integral part of our business model. Obviously, we're in the business of buying an asset that produces cash flow on a net basis um, after all expenses, and then we want to grow that over time. And simply put. Uh, at a 5% cap rate, every dollar a month we add to a property is worth $240 in value. Okay, so, um, so the value of that dollar is, is very valuable. So we, we basically consider ourselves in the business of finding $240 dollars. That's what we're in the business of. Um, and so when you then look at net operating income growth over the last 20 years, the two best performing asset classes in real estate are self-storage and mobile home parks. Um, now, if you were to look at a, a 20 year chart of it, um, it's at any given time, if you were to stop along the way, it would be either mobile home parks or self-storage as number one and number two. And then multifamily is generally third and then apartments or not apartments, malls and industrial and office and everything else. Um, and so, so at some points, storage leads mobile home parks and other times mobile home parks lead storage, but they kind of are constantly competing. The 20-year the average growth rate for both is 4.3% per year. 
So ironically, both have had the same exact point-to-point -point average growth rate. But then when you look at how they got there, the short summation is mobile home parks or manufactured housing is much more consistent. It's rise over run has a, a more narrow variance. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little bit more um, predictable. Historically, it's been more predictable, more stable, more consistent. Self-storage has been more elastic. Um, if a portfolio is purely elastic, that may not be a great thing. And if it's an entirely, um, you know, kind of plotting along, that may not be a great thing. So we like the consistency that manufactured housing provides with the elasticity of self-storage. And I guess to just end cap that with more recent experience, you know, talking about, I guess, COVID just briefly, um, both did very well during COVID. Uh, on a year-over-year -year basis, both asset classes have done great. But if you had to pick one through COVID, you would likely wanted to own manufactured housing. However, starting in January of this year, if you had to pick one, you would have definitely picked self-storage. I mean, self-storage has been, I mean, we, we're raising rents in some of our properties two or three times a day, um, but certainly several times a week because of just how dynamic the market's been. So that's that elasticity. So anyway, that's, that's the short story. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, you and I, we uh, we met up a few months ago in, uh, in Newport Beach. We walked one of your properties there that you guys had owned for a long time. And, it, you know, we were talking about in Newport Beach, you have this beautiful, big uh, self-storage center there. And it's interesting how both of these, it, there's an issue in a lot of places where there's just there's just no more room. There's nowhere to put these self-storage. And then uh, particularly with, uh, when you're talking about mobile home parks, um, the, actually the supply is actually shrinking kind of over, it, it, very few get added and so many get moved mm -hmm. out. And so it's interesting having, um, so how do, you, how do you look at that when you're looking at, uh, I guess at new deals, um, you're looking for a certain, you know, limits on how much self-storage there is there, or, you know, I guess how much land is available when it comes to mobile home parks and, and the scarcity, of course, uh, it, it provides a big hedge towards, you know, any sort of competition or inflation. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. And you're speaking to point number one on our diligence checklist across, by the way, both asset classes. Um, the number one question we, we have to answer is, is the asset moated? <clears throat> is there a high barrier to entry? So to give you an example, um, we're closing on a property. Um, it's slated for this Thursday. Um, it's in the Washington, D.C. metro. It's in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, it's about 100,000 feet. Um, you know, great Alexandria as a, as a market is, is a great market, but within Alexandria, this property sits in a really good spot. So just real rough numbers. Um, the current demand in that area is roughly nine feet per person of storage and supply is roughly four feet of storage, uh, four feet per person. So there's obviously a supply demand imbalance. And so that's the number one question we have is, is it moated? Well, that we know this market well. We have other assets in the market. So the, the is it moted box is, is well checked. And if checked, then we go on to all the other diligence questions. But the first question we have is, is it moted? And to the extent that it is at closing and continues to be so, and we think um, you know Amazon HQ2 is coming in in Crystal City, which is about a half mile up the road, you know, they can't build um, housing quick enough. Uh, we think there will be a high moat remaining um, and persisting in the market as the preference is to housing, not storage or other uh, other land uses. So in short, you know, we, we think the moat is there. We think it'll continue to grow and we think that'll continue to give us abilities to, to, to grow our revenues for a long time without as much competition um, and one begets the other. Yeah, it is amazing looking at, a, at an area too, the idea of a moat. Uh, I've talked a lot about um, with our past investors about Warren Buffett. And I think that's one of his things he talks about, you know, you want to have a business that has, you know, it's like a castle that's defended, right? It's got this huge moat around it that nobody can swim across. So there's sharks in the water or whatever. So the idea that, yeah, there's, there's very little land there that people can compete and try to cross that moat and get in your castle and pillage your yep. castle. So um, you mentioned something that I think is interesting. You said, uh, I'll go back to something you said earlier about for every dollar you, uh, you know, you increase uh, in rents, it's $240 in value. And that's interesting because in multifamily, you know, our business is, is mostly multifamily. 
it's a similar thing. It's there. You do, you know, you do a little bit of work and you're able to increase rents. Some of it's market appreciation or other times it's forced appreciation and you get that. And it just has this huge, huge return on the actual bottom line and the, and the growth. And I think it's a lot of people, um, I don't know if they fully understand just how important that value add uh, component is to it. I know you actually, I, wanted, I was actually going to ask you this. You own some of these assets for a very, very long time. Some of your funds are kind of long-ended funds and you've had some, I think this one we walked through, you'd had for, your group has had it for 20 years or something or a very long time. And you know, in 10 years or it'd be worth twice as much, it'll just kind of keep it worth it more, especially as the Fed prints uh, more money. But how often do you go in and you know once you do a value add on a project and you kind of do check all those boxes, is it, you know, typically five, 10 years? I know it depends on the asset itself. It depends if we're talking, you know, mobile home parks or self-storage, but are you looking kind of for like a one-time pop and that value add, or do you just continually go in and say, here's an opportunity here, here's an opportunity here. And how do you kind of approach that? Yeah. So I guess conceptually, I'll start with the conceptual and then go to that specific um, answer. So conceptually to your point earlier, there's, there's kind of a forced appreciation component and a market appreciation you know, there's the forced appreciation is typically temporal and short term, you know, one to three years, depending on the asset and the operator to be wider than just ourselves. Um, and then market takes over. But if you look over a 20 year period of ownership, it's a lot more market than it is forced appreciation. So um, depending on kind of if you're in a total return view or an IRR view, um, you know, short term and, and kind of time value of money, uh, quick flips, um, depends on how much forced versus market. But we think if you're in the right, right market for the long time, if you have the right asset in the right market for a long period of time, what you can do is, is pretty incredible. So we're long-term holders uh, of real estate. Um, you know, it's kind of the, I, I, I use Buffett's name sparingly because I think his name is, you know, largely overused. However, <laughs> I, I probably it, overuse him mostly. It's probably no, mostly. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I don't think you do, but I mean, it just, you see it everywhere. So I bet, but he has a saying that I ascribe to, you know, subscribe to, and it's, um, uh, you know, you, you don't buy any, you don't own anything for 10 minutes that you're not worth, you know, you're willing to own for 10 years. So for us, you know, like this property we're buying, um, closing on on Thursday, that's something I can see us owning for 20 to 30 years. So we want to own for a very long time, you know, with regards to our capital, we want to, you know, we want to buy assets, add value to the assets, return capital in the short run, but hold assets for the long run. Uh, and then our, our partners then remain as owner in the asset for the long run, unless they want to be bought out at various points along the line. So now we wanna create liquidity options from time to time where people could obtain liquidity if they want to, but not mandate it uh, if they don't want to. Right. So you give people options along the way. I'd actually, I'd love to kind of learn a little more to how you structure your uh, fund. Again, we're not promoting any specific deal. We're just, it's good to know how you, how you structure this because the other funds may be structured similarly. So uh, you, you guys have a blind fund that basically owns assets in different classes. Blind fund, meaning people don't, you know, they invest in the fund. They don't know exactly which assets you're going to be purchasing. I mean, some are obviously, I guess it'd be semi-blind because some of them are already in there and some are continually being added. But uh, how does it work as far as uh, in general, I don't know if you can talk about returns or just a structure of how that works. There's some now it's a five, 10 year hole. Like what, what, what's a common way that you guys do your funds? Yeah. So there's, so currently the, the fund launches as a blind fund. Generally um, there's some exception to that, but it's generally a blind fund. Currently our fund is semi blind because we, to your point, we have assets in the fund now and continue to have more. Um, and, and so the way, you know, you, you have different investors that have different, you know, everybody's got their own philosophy and kind of flavor on things. But generally speaking, there's a bucket of investors that like to be the last person in the fund. Um, but the challenge is there's no opportunity to be the last if there was nobody who was the first. Um, right. And so what we do is we, we create a, a, a kind of a system, of a built-in schema in the fund where the, the first people in get the best economic return as compared with the last. Um, so we do that by, there's kind of a, a degrading split. It's probably not the most marketable way of saying it, but you start at a, a certain split, back end split on the sale of assets. And for every $10 million that comes in the fund, it goes down two and a half percentage points for every $10 million. So it, you, know, you can kind of pick your path uh, on where you want to be, all things being equal. Um, but we also, to kind of to your earlier point, we've been doing this so long, you know, the majority of our 
early investors or people who've been with us for years and years and years. And many of them have been in, invested in two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we have one that's been in all eight of our funds. Actually, I think more than one. But anyway, the point being is the people who know us generally go in early and then the people who are new tend to be towards the end and then rinse and repeat uh, on the next one. Right, right. So I guess if people are, maybe they're unfamiliar with a fund um, structure that's, uh, you know, maybe thinking, and I get this question sometimes, even when talking about multifamily syndication, like, oh, is this, you know, is this like a REIT or something or when it comes to a real estate fund? So how would you kind of see this as being different than more of a, a REIT or a financial asset that people do in Wall Street and they go and buy? Maybe you can just kind of touch base how your fund would be different than something like that. Yeah, I would say there's pros and cons to be fair, you know, uh, to not say ours is the best and REITs are silly, you know, because it's that's not exhaustively true. Um, I, I would say just, I guess, simply put, you know, REITs, one of the benefits is you have to a degree market liquidity, and that's a benefit and a negative, depending on what the market's doing, that could be really great or really terrible. Um, so then one of the benefits to a degree that a, a, a private fund like ours, and it's private, there's no market liquidity, you can't click a button and sell. You know, there might be some secondary markets, but they're certainly not robust that you can trade on. Um, but in short, you know, you don't have necessarily that market liquidity or that market correlation because we're private. We also don't have Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, we don't have the expense that uh, to report as a public company would have to. We don't have, there's certain requirements we were not mandated um, to operate under, which may be positive, may be negative. Um, but in short, we kind of are free to do, um, you know, we're free to pursue what we think is best without having, you know, onerous regulation. Now we are under the SEC, so we are regulated. So I don't want to paint a picture like we're, you know, <laughs> all, all to our own because that's not the case. Um, but we have a little bit more freedom. We're private. Um, you know, we can we can make the dis the best dis decisions as managers uh, over time based on our kind of determination and discretion, rather than being um, kind of having to implement some kind of predetermined schema. Right. Yeah, I find too. Um, there's a lot of things that you shared are, are very relevant. And then the interesting thing about a lot of REITs is that a lot of times they they're so big. And there's so much, you know, sometimes even a trillion dollars or, you know, many billions of dollars in there that it's, it's, they have to buy the nicest, newest assets and there's less incentive to go in and do those value add projects because they're more work, right? It's actually get things that they just try to get really brand new stuff. And it's just, it can feel much less personal. Also, are there any differences as far as tax benefits between a real estate investment trust and the like, just type of fund that you're doing? So I, I wouldn't know because that's not my kind of area of expertise. I, there are differences, I believe, um, but from what I from what I know, kind of the way we go about things, and I, I'll just say it this way: it, it is not the tax benefits are not insignificant. You know, um, and back actually, uh, one thing on your earlier point, just I guess the the other thing to mention is, you know, typically REITs are they they tend to buy assets that they can hold longer term. And so back to that forced appreciation versus market appreciation. So they're trying to generally buy assets where there's a forced, maybe a forced appreciation opportunity, but then they, they really want to buy in, a, in an area where they see a long opportunity for market appreciation on a compounding basis. So it's not really, it's not good versus bad, big versus, it's just, it's really two different models. You know, if, if somebody wants to get in there and do a quick churn in one, two, three years, that's not the REIT model. And, you know, and in this cycle, the last 10 years, that's certainly been accommodative, you know, because there's been increasing capital flows, there's been decreasing cap rates or increasing multiples. Um, you know, so that's definitely been accommodative. I, I, I question if the next 10 years will be as accommodative. We'll see. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting as some of the, it seems like when you own a REIT, sometimes you own, you own the market. So it's a lot less, yeah. you have, you have more control when you're, uh, maybe you have fewer assets or you're just buying different types of assets I find. And again, it's just much more of yeah. a financial asset rather than actually a, a real estate, even though it is real estate, it's just, you own mm -hmm. so much that it's very hard to be different than the market because there's so much there. Um, let's talk about this real quick. Um, for our listeners, like what would you say like the, the typical investor looks like or what are some of the problems they're trying to solve when they would invest in your fund? Some of the problems that you solve, I would say. 
You know, yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't know um, necessarily all the problems that in their mind that I'm solving for them. Um, but what we think, I would say, what we think we do well is one, you know, we're, we're conservative. We have a lot of experience. So that typically lends, to, lends itself to conservatism. You know, uh, the longer you've been around, the more you've seen. So the more, um, I would say not defensive in a negative, but you, you're, you, you tend to be more conservative. We're conservative. Um, you know, the two asset classes, the national footprint, um, the, the access to deal flow, financing, you know, the vertical integration. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, there, there's not a, a ton of places people can go to get what we think we offer uh, in the way that we offer it. So we, we think we're a fairly unique quantity and feel free to cue the eye rolling of every listener because everybody's unique in their own mind. You know, but that's at least how we think we're unique. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You and I had a conversation about this a while ago, and I thought it was a really interesting comment because I hadn't really heard this before, but it makes sense that when uh, that you guys don't really give specific projections around your deals, you'll basically uh, you'll talk more about this is this is what we're doing. These are the type of assets that we're buying. These are the values that we have, and basically. Mm-hmm. A lot of times the more sophisticated someone is that they talk more about values and less about returns. A lot of beginning or kind of newer investors, it's all about returns, but people that are more sophisticated or even institutions that are more sophisticated, it's more about, are you a fit from a values perspective? Can you talk maybe a little bit about that and kind of just that sure. conversation? Yeah. And there's, there's, there's actually an implication to the sponsor operator to this and to the, uh, to the investor. So there's kind of two paths you can kind of take with this, but in short, I'll start with, to me, the greatest risk in a deal is the people. For those who are considering investing with us, the biggest risk is us, right? And so um, I'm not, I don't believe I'm doing you as an investor. Uh, I, I believe I'm doing you as an investor a disservice if I'm distracting you from me. You know, the bullseye should be on my face, right? And that's, I don't love saying that, but that's, that's where the bullseye is, right? I'm, I'm the greatest risk. You can Photoshop Weston. one in there too, right on your head. As soon as it lands, it'd be a yeah, heck of exactly. a trip. You're like, no, I'm, now, it's, now this is good. Um, but, but in short, what, what I find is a lot of the newer operators, the people who are coming up, you know, and raising capital, you know, I'm presuming, but I think sometimes they feel like they may not survive the scrutiny left alone, right? Um, their background, their track record, all of that would maybe not survive. So what they do is they create these shiny objects to the left and to the right to say, hey, look over here. Don't look at me. Don't look over here or shoot over here. Here's the bullseye. More specifically, the challenge I have with models is number one, um, you know, um, you know, number one, hundred percent of all the models are wrong. There's a hundred percent chance it'll be wrong. And the question, the question isn't, do we have models? We have models. We just don't use them for marketing because there's a hundred percent chance they'll be wrong. And I don't think that's, you know, cause if I, if I showed a model that said, Hey, we have a 39 IRR projection. Do you think people are going to scrub whether or not they trust me as much? Or will they say, yeah, I can talk to them. Seems coherent, but they have 39 IRR. You know, the, the point is that that's a distraction from their biggest risk, which is me. So we drop the projection, by the way, we don't have internal projections of 39 IRR, but the point being is um, there's number one, hundred percent of them are wrong, uh, will be wrong. That's probably not um, the basis for investment decisions. So there's, there's many other from a regulatory compliance from all the other stuff. It's just, <clears throat> we, it doesn't change much. Um, I had a guy probably two months ago, say, you know, do you have a model? And I said, yes, but we don't use it for marketing. And he goes, well, everybody else has a model. And my comment was, why are we, that's, that's perfect. That's great. We, we don't have them. We don't offer them. You know, here's, you know, here's who we are. Here's what we've done. And ultimately it, that's, that's really what we think the, the focus should be on is kind of the, who, who the team is, what's the character, what are the, what's the model they're implementing in terms of what quality assets, what markets and, all that's spelled out, but you just can't project a a model. Uh, You can't project rather a return or create an expectation for such. So anyway, we, we think on a risk adjusted basis, it's, it's in the investor's best interest not to do that. Right. No, that is, that's uh, it's, it's a unique approach and I wanted to address it. It makes a lot of sense when you, when you talk about it. Um, What what are some things, and I think you said every model is wrong. Uh, What are some things that 
you know, can go wrong on a property. I know that for us, we give projections and, you know, we, you know, some things are better or some things are worse, but what are some things when it comes to that you see that are common in self-storage or mobile home or manufacturing communities? Yeah, there's, there's a lot. I mean, and, and I guess there's a difference between going wrong in terms of a model that you're, you're marketing. Um, because to your point, you know, anyway, there, there's a lot I can talk about on that, but in short, you know, things that have gone wrong. Um, you know, I, I think the biggest, biggest mistake people can, the, the biggest risk is the people you're investing in. So I think, you know, that's something, you know, people should really heavily vet are the operators, you know, the people behind the product, so to speak. But at the asset level, um, you know, there's a lot of things that can go wrong from management strategy. You know, I see a lot of um, structures where it's people managing, people managing people. Um, they're not built for scale very well. And I've, I've, we've gone through that. We've seen that firsthand, you know, um, kind of management models that aren't built to scale. And then we had to kind of, um, for lack of a better term, hit delete and try something new, um, make it more efficient. And um, so there's, there's management structures. There's, um, you know, over the years, we've, we've really focused and narrowed our view in terms of what we're looking for. So, you know, on the mobile home park side, 150 units or more. You know, public utilities, we don't dabble with any private utilities where 15 years ago we might have done some, you know, bought a property on septic or well water or, a, you know, a, a wastewater treatment plant or a lift station or some of these things. We don't do that anymore. So, you know, as we've grown, we've kind of narrowed our, our view in terms of what we're interested in. Um, yeah, I can, I can, you know, the other one, I guess, just it comes to mind is um, we also really like to deal with, um, Kind of properties that are brought through the brokerage community, especially the, the more reputable brokers. Um, so we, when we started, we did a lot of off market. You know, we did the mailings and the cold calls, and uh, we have a whole story on how we did that. That um, one of the first deals we ever did in our early twenties, early mid twenties, it's a mobile home park. It was a private, private deal. You know, direct with the seller, and um, he falsified all of his information. You know, so we bought the property and day one we're like okay rut row you know this isn't <laughs> yeah <laughs> all of all of his financials were falsified oh, no. you know um and you find out and you know we ended up because of the way we did our diligence we had you know uh, we had a legal case against him which you know we we ended up resolving it because we had leverage in the way that we did our diligence but the point is it was just a hassle um, and we came out ahead financially but you know over the years we've just really learned that you know oftentimes the better deals and the more um, kind of bankable deals more often or not are coming through the brokerage community. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because I think a lot of times everybody's looking for a screaming deal and everybody wants to, you know, there's this big thing about off market stuff, but in sure. general, like you said, if you if like the situation you gave there that, um, you know, it, the information was wrong and they'd falsified everything versus, you know, a broker would actually kind of come in and, and, and help to kind of make sure those numbers are right. There's a reputation. There's maybe some legal stuff risk for them as well. So I think yep. that's really, uh, really interesting. Uh, well, I appreciate you explaining about, uh, the, you know, the asset classes you work with. I want to kind of shift gears a little bit to a little bit more about you personally. Um, what about for you? Do you invest in anything passively outside of your fund or outside of these, uh, asset classes? We try to ask you know, a lot of people that are our listeners are investing in different types of things. And we're trying to introduce people to new asset classes. What do you invest in? You know, so I, I, this is an abnormal probably answer, but I invest in my community. Uh, we're really big on investing locally. Um, and that's, I say investing, you know, it could be charitable giving in a way, which is, an, I look at it as an investment, but, um, but we're really big on investing into our local community, um, into the fabric of, of our local community. So that's, um, that's where most of our kind of free cash goes is, is local. That's awesome. Yeah. I know you have, uh, you have some really unique stuff that you've done as far as, um, you know, your, and your spouse is involved in the business as well. You guys do a lot of this stuff together. You travel together um, and you have four kids, right? You have four, even little, you have like a two-year-old, I think is your youngest. Is two, that four, right? seven, eight. Yep. Two, who do we appreciate? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and I love that you're giving back to your community. Um, what's one personal growth book or resource that's been helpful to you personally? Oh man, so many. Um, I, I'll give you um, one person and a book. Um, so anything by Tim Keller, who's a mm -hmm. hero of mine. My son's name's Keller after him. And he's just a, a, so the C.S. Lewis of our time uh, to me. 
Uh, so anything by Tim Keller, actually uh, two more books. One is a, a, another book by J.R. Tolkien um, called Leaf by Niggle. Um, that's, a, that's been a, a huge encouragement to me. I actually travel with copies of that and hand them out, um, Leaf by Niggle. And then third is written a book written by a dear friend of mine uh, whose name is Greg Brenneman. And Greg wrote a book called Right Away and All at Once. Um, and so uh, anyway, that book is... Uh, Greg is a stud. Uh, just I can go on all day about how great he is. But but anyway, that book he wrote really has been impactful to us. That's awesome. Well, Ryan, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to uh, be with us today. Uh, obviously, we're friends. We go back a long time with a lot of common interests and values. But I uh, just really want to uh, honor the way that you are just very uh, great at you know, not only explaining what you do, but you know your values and how that all comes together in your business and even doing things a little different than some other groups because it, it more closely aligns with your values. So I really appreciate that for you. What are, what are some ways, what's maybe one way, a way someone can get in touch with you if they want to learn more? Yeah. Anybody who, if I can be helpful, reach out anytime. Um, so my direct line is 407-602-7662. Um, and then our, my email is ryan at elevationcg.com. Awesome. Well, Ryan, thanks again for coming. This has been great. We'd love to do this again. Appreciate you explaining about all this stuff and look forward to seeing you soon. Great being with you. So as you can see, Ryan's a pretty knowledgeable guy, really uh, done a lot of things over the years. Um, A few takeaways that I got from this was the value add component in real estate is applicable to different asset classes by increasing $1 in rent. Uh, He said he increases $240 in value. That's huge. That applies to different asset classes such as multifamily. That's why we do value add multifamily. Uh, Also, he started doing uh, initially doing single family uh, investing, and then he basically was able to scale into mobile home parks and other things. A lot of, uh, I'm sure many of you do single family and realize after a while it's a lot of work and it doesn't actually lead to financial freedom for most people. And it just really becomes another job. And especially if you're well paid, that can be a very expensive job for you to do if you're a high paid professional or you have a business, uh, because a lot of times we undervalue our time. Um, and then he talked about the model projections. They don't offer projections. Um, they, they more kind of align based on values. I find that really uh, unique and very interesting. And uh, so that's that's something that I, I thought was very interesting. And then he talked a lot about, uh, well, he talked a little bit at the end about being a community, uh, giving back, really having, you know, what are some things you invest in? He said he gives in to the community. They do, they have different programs and ways that they do that. This guy really believes in what he's doing. And then one last thing was about uh, working with uh, off-market deals that they actually prefer to, to not work with off-market deals, probably because of their size, as well as just having issues. They had a guy say, hey, um, you know, here's my numbers. And they were all fake. So that's an issue versus if you have a broker involved, that's much less likely to happen because a broker's reputation, there's some legal risk on the line for the group as well. So uh, off-market is not always better. So just a little lesson there. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. We'd love to hear your comments. Look forward to hearing you on the next CNU in the next video or episode. You've been listening to the Mailbox Money Podcast. For more free resources, articles, and videos, go to bronsonequity.com. There you can download your copy of the special report, The Single Best Investment Strategy During and After a Pandemic. None of the information shared here is an offer to buy a specific investment, and this is for educational purposes only. Consult your financial, legal, and tax professionals and use your own common sense before making any investment decisions. Thanks for joining us and be sure to tune in next time for more Mailbox Money.